uh, the public domain data set of uh, taxi rides from the city of Porto. There are, there are 1.7 million taxi trajectories. Um, and we'd really just like to do some uh, typical exploratory analysis to see what the data set looks like. A typical way you would do this in sort of statistics or like uh, just general uh, scientific analysis, you would like do some subset of the data, you'd apply some typical uh, uh, summary statistics or, or some type of simplified model on this, and you would just see what happens. But here we're going to take the philosophy of probabilistic modeling. We're actually going to take the full data set, we're going to posit a model on it, we're going to perform some form of posterior inference, we're going to continue this cycle. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We applied some uh, very simplified probabilistic BCA to this. Um, and we analyze what this looks like. This is basically a mixture of uh, different components where you can recognize that in this city, there are certain colors or specific clusters that are very close to the city center of Porto. And then there are various other clusters that are going to the outskirts. And this gives you sort of a sense of where the most common or most frequent taxi rides tend to cluster around. And of course, um, if you recognize that probabilistic PCA is just a Gaussian process latent variable model with linear kernel. You can imagine just taking this uh, model and extending it a little bit further to make analysis slightly more complicated and interesting. OK. So here's another application. So here we're interested in analyzing physical systems. So uh, imagine that there are two populations uh, in this ecological data sets. Um, and it's basically the sizes of the populations over time. Um, a typical way to analyze this is to have some predator-prey uh, simulator model, where basically you start with some initial conditions for uh, what the initial populations are, and you see them evolve over time according to some uh, differential equation. And in this process, the likelihood is basically trying to integrate over the entire differential equation, starting from the initial conditions all the way to a specific time step. In this process, you can basically only simulate from the model, and it's very hard to calculate density without using um, very complicated and sometimes uh, poorly approximate PDE solvers. Um, and in this case, we've uh, used Edward to really scale these things to very large uh, time series. And Rajesh will be talking a bit more about uh, this application. Uh, in another application, we're also interested in some AI. So here we're, we're trying to do image generation or just compression of uh, some data set, where you have uh, some uh, unsupervised model. You're trying to model uh, P of x, where x is uh, some matrix or a tensor or et cetera. And you're really just trying to posit some model that can best compress the, the data set um, according to its model parameters. And in this case, uh, what tends to be the best is what you may have heard of as a generative adversarial network or some implicit model where you can simulate from the model, but you can't calculate the density. Uh, and in this example, uh, you're, you're, you're just trying to build a generative model of images. Uh, in this case, it's the downsampled version of ImageNet. Uh, here's another example. So in this one, we're interested in just doing causality. We want to understand how genetic factors in this very large uh, corpus of 1.6 billion genetic measurements from uh, individual SNPs, so values uh, of pairs like CC, uh, GA, et cetera, actually affect uh, specific traits of interest. So like, how does your metabolic levels uh, arise from your, from your genome? How, does, um, how do specific diseases are caused by specific genetic factors in um, in your genome. And all of this is through probabilistic models. Uh, you have a process, uh, some generative process, starting from the cause, and you go all the way to the effect. And uh, through Edward, you can just use standard probabilistic modeling tools to really understand cause and effect. OK. Oh, and the last application, uh, this one is actually using uh, a Cox process, which is a Gaussian process with a Poisson likelihood. And here, we're just using it to try to do spatial analysis of basketball data. You can imagine in this data set, there are a bunch of uh, uh, different shot locations uh, with a bunch of NBA players. Uh, we collected this data set. Or we didn't collect this data set. We got it from Andrew Miller, who's from uh, Ryan Adams Group. Uh, and this data set is just a bunch of uh, individual points on the basketball court. And you're trying to analyze where uh, NBA players are most likely to make uh, uh, good shots. So here there are two specific basketball players. There's uh, Stephen Curry and Demarcus. And just by exploring different inference algorithms, you can understand the posterior uncertainty with respect to how well they would make certain shots. I'll go into this a little bit more later. OK, so how, what is probabilistic programming? How does this relate to all those applications? So 
browser programming is a relatively nascent field. I think people would come up with different definitions according to who you'd ask. Um, how I would really define probabilistic programming is just from this single sentence. That probabilistic programming is really about reifying models from mathematics, from symbols, to physical objects. So you have actual tangible concepts that you can wield. And what I mean by that is that each model is really equipped with memory and computation. Um, you can think of memory as actually being uh, quantifiable through the bits to, actually, to store the model parameters, to store the, memory, the model architecture. So this is actually something that you can hold on a physical device. Uh, computation is with respect to how, does it, how, how many flops does it actually take to sample from the model, to calculate log probs, to do training, to do testing. All those things are considerations once you really take the mathematics behind something from, say, the age of Gauss, and you try to implement these things in the age of Turing. Um, and to emphasize, anything you really do lives in the world of problems of programming. Uh, any computable model that you would work with is somehow necessary to be able to represent a computer, which you can then do some data analysis on. Any inference algorithm you want to do has to be computable, and the range of algorithms that you would want to do, automated inference, uh, model-specific algorithms, or even trying to do inference within inference, like Bayesian optimization, all of those things are uh, living in the world of probabilistic programming. And then now you see any application you would imagine the exploratory analysis I was talking about, uh, object recognition and, and, and computer vision, code generation, causality, uh, probabilistic programming. Um, there is this uh, hypothesis uh, in AI that um, the world is a simulation from a computer that you may have heard of. Um, one way of, of viewing that hypothesis is uh, through probabilistic modeling, that basically what you're saying is that um, there is some probabilistic program in the world that has generated uh, reality. And if you wanted to do probabilistic modeling in the Bayesian sense, that there is some true mo probability model, and we're recovering this true probability model through positing some family distributions, inferring the posterior, getting the closest uh, member of the family to the true distribution, all of that requires that there is a true process. And in the simulation hypothesis, that's exactly what we're saying, that there is a probabilistic program that has generated the real world, and we're trying to approximate that with the family. That makes sense so far. OK, that's all at a very high level. There are a lot of systems for positive programming that has been around for a while. Um, uh, this is a slide taken from uh, Frank Wood, who works, who's the leader of Anglican and has done lots of fantastic stuff in positive programming. Here's how he sort of divided the many systems uh, that do positive programming. Uh, you have a lot of people, you have a lot of uh, work from computer science that was really focused on uh, symbolic algebra and discrete random variables. You have a lot on practical uh, computation with respect to statistics, and this. Um, it's probably most known through bugs and jags. And um, as, um, as history has sort of progressed, uh, we sort of converged onto um, some more mainstay of probabilistic programming languages. You may have heard of Stan or PyMC3 or uh, what I'll be talking about today, which is Edward. OK. Um, so in order to, to describe Edward, I'd really like to start by describing this figure here, who's George Box. And in particular, I'm going to uh, address one particular thing that he really pioneered, which is this iterative process for science. How does this iterative process uh, go? Well, the first step is that given some phenomena you're interested in analyzing, you're going to build a model of the science. In other words, some generative process for how that phenomena came to be. Given uh, some uh, data sets, um, some empirical information for how the phenomena arises, you're going to be able to make inferences about the model, perhaps update your information, conditional on both the empirical information from your data set and the prior assumptions you're making in the model. And third, which is very important, you're going to be able to actually criticize how your model fits the data. So you're going to interrogate the assumptions that you're making in your model, and you're going to see how well that aligns with the actual uh, empirical information that you're making in your data set. And this process is really just a um, very uh, specific instantiation of the scientific method. You're really going through all the, the steps, and you're following, you're following this process where in the third step, after criticizing the model assumptions, you're going back to step one. You're refining the modeling assumptions, and you're continuing this process. So, how, so we call this process Box's Loop, uh, named after George Box. Um, and Edward is really the library designed around uh, this loop. Uh, Edward is Box's middle name, and we really just uh, followed this probabilistic programming semantics of um, naming systems after uh, famous uh, fellows. Um, so 
really Edward is going to have a bunch of classes to support many different compositions of models, many different choices of inference algorithms, and many different ways to do criticism. Um, and really tries to ingrain this philosophy that if we wanted to do practical uh, data analysis, all that's going to live through this uh, cycle. Um, and to give some overview, we really have an active community of several thousand users and many contributors. Uh, there, there are many commits daily, and the community has really grown for the past uh, year and a half or so that Edward has uh, been mainstream. So let me go through some overview of um, some Edward semantics, and then afterwards I'll go into specific uh, Gaussian process applications. So uh, how, does, how does Edward represent models? So the first thing is that we're really going to start with a primitive, which is a random variable. And the random variable is, is a pretty simple object. It's just going to be a class, and it's going to be parameterized by tensors or multidimensional arrays. So you can imagine that if you wanted to define a normal random variable, you would just have a univariate distribution with parameters, uh, with scalar parameters determining how many random variables are in that normal. If you wanted to represent a vector of five univariate normals, you would just have a vector of five zeros or a vector of five scale parameters, and that would represent five normal random variables. And then obviously, you want to do matrices, tensors, et cetera. And then obviously, if you wanted to use these random variables, you might equip them with various methods, like logprob, mean, sample, uh, variance, uh, mode, et cetera. Now, importantly, if you wanted to use uh, probabilistic programming in conjunction with computational graphs, data flow graphs, or things in TensorFlow or Theano, what we would do is basically represent each of these random variables according to some tensor that actually is represented in the computational graph itself. And how we do this is to take some tensor x star and represent this through a draw from the random variable. This will be concrete in the next slide. And then obviously, if you wanted to represent mutable states, which I'll also elaborate on, these are things that allow random variables to condition on values they can change during training. If you wanted to write discriminative models, p of y given x, where x is some input, you're going to define a tensor, some mutable state, that you can then allow to, tr to change during training. This will allow you to change the input during batch training if you wanted to data subsampling where that input changes. And then obviously, if you wanted model parameters to actually uh, do parameter estimation, the t tensors would change. These things are mutable within the computational graph. OK, so here's perhaps the simplest example uh, in Bayesian analysis. So imagine you wanted to model coin flips. There are 50 uh, coin flips that you observed, and all of them are valued between 0 and 1. Maybe heads is 1, tails is 0. Um, and one uh, model to do this is to imagine there is some latent probability shared across all of the coin flips, and we're going to put a beta prior for that with, uh, with hyperparameters 1 and 1. And we're going to have some Bernoulli likelihood, which is conditionally independent given that shared probability for each of the data points. And so each draw is going to uh, arise by drawing from some beta distribution, drawing from a beta distribution, and drawing all of the uh, coin flips conditional on that beta probability. And so in, in the problems programming language, that's exactly what we're doing. We're assigning theta to some uh, beta distribution that's a scalar. And then we're, then we're assigning x to be a vector, where there's a, uh, there is a one vector, uh, there's, a 50, uh, there's a vector of length 50, each of which elements are 1. And we're multiplying that by theta. So we're sharing theta across all of the 50 elements. So if you imagine this as the computational graph, which is on the right, it's, it's basically that process. If you wanted it to actually sample from this computational graph, all this is symbolic at the moment, but if you actually wanted to fetch x from the graph, it would go through the process. It would draw a value from theta. Uh, theta star represents the sample from theta. Uh, x star represents the sample from x, and it would go through that process. And importantly, all computation is represented on this computational graph, the random variables and all the tensors associated with it. So if you wanted to do symbolic algebra, if you wanted to reduce some of the computation to make things more numerically stable, for example, uh, if you didn't explicitly do log sum x, but you could imagine that just by from the graph, you could recognize various numerical instabilities. You could do that. If you wanted to simplify some of the nodes in the graph, if you wanted to do conjugacy, uh, various forms of exact inference in uh, Bayesian analysis, all of those things are possible precisely because you represented all of the computation on the graph. Okay. So now that we discovered, now that we explained the basics of uh, modeling, how does process programming really help Gaussian process for modeling? So here are a few points. 
uh, Gaussian processes, what I think of, are, are really just a object that you can use, or a module that you can uh, play around with in, in various uh, circumstances. One is that you can really just take these things and compare them against other model classes and experiments. You might define a Gaussian process classification for uh, some supervised learning task. And if you wanted to use this as a baseline for other things, you would just replace the Gaussian process classification model with a Bayesian neural net, with logistic regression, any of these uh, classic techniques. Analogously, um, instead of just contrasting with other model classes, you can start to combine them with uh, various things. If you wanted to use batch normalization, a technique in neural network training, to improve information flow as you do gradient descents, if you wanted to employ dropout for deep GPs, if you wanted to even do convolutions for parameter sharing or recurrence for recurrent sort of Gaussian processes, all, of things are, all these things are possible precisely because there is one library uh, one system that has all of the primitives for which you can just start to play around with many of these things. Uh, and obviously, you can have deep GPs, deep kernels, where the kernels are themselves are compositions of uh, very complex nonlinear functions, and you can start to do hierarchical GPs. You have individual GPs over small data sets, and you have some uh, perhaps latent function or some parameter sharing in general that uh, aggregates the information across the individual data sets. And uh, and obviously, you can also work with flexible priors of the kernel hyperparameters and non-Gaussian likelihoods. So here's an example, a very uh, simple example. So imagine you just want to do Gaussian process classification. Recall that in order to do GP classification, you're, you're, you're taking uh, a data set of paired inputs, or paired inputs and outputs. There's x's and y's. Imagine that x's are uh, a vector of features. And here, I'm defining what is a mutable state. It's placeholder that is a matrix of n by d, where imagine n is the uh, data set size, the total number of data points, d is the uh, number of features. Now we're going to write down some latent function. Here I'm going to represent it by the uh, evaluations. So it's just going to be a lower triangular multivariate normal. And the lower triangular uh, multivariate normal is going to be parameterized by a location parameter, the mean, which is just a vector of uh, n zeros. And there's a uh, lower triangular scale parameter. So the Kolesky factorization of what you can imagine is some uh, user-implemented RBF function, which takes in x, the matrix x's input, and will output uh, n by d by d, or something. And finally, given the latent function, you would draw from a Bernoulli likelihood. And that's going to determine all of the uh, zeros and ones that are the output of uh, the classification. That should be fairly straightforward. Any questions so far? OK. Analogously, if you wanted to really compare that to other experiments, so imagine that um, you wanted to check how well a finite approximation to a GP would work. So you, you're just going to do a Bayesian neural network, a very vanilla Bayesian neural network, where you imagine there is uh, one hidden layer. There are weights and bias, uh, biases per layer for, uh, for the hidden layer and the output layer. How does this work? There is some input n by d. Uh, there is some output. It's also Bernoulli. But instead of some latent function, it's just going to be uh, matrix multiplications with some activation function after the mat mole and bias, and then finally another mat mole and bias. Okay. Here's emphasize uh, also how, how easy it is to just sort of play around with these different modeling extensions. So you wanted to do a Gaussian process latent variable model for unsupervised learning. Instead of representing x as some observed input, you would just have some prior over x. So in this case, if you're trying to model some output y, which is n by d dimensional uh, for a general unsupervised learning, you'd imagine that there is some latent input, which is n by q, where q is much lower dimensional than uh, d. Uh, you'd still have some latent function. Here, it's uh, n by d dimensional. And, and obviously, you still have some class key of an RBF, uh, a, a class key factorization of some function. And then the output is still Bernoulli, if it's all zeros and ones for like binarized uh, data sets. Or it can be um, some, other, some other likelihood. Oh, uh, yeah, that's an, that's, that's an error. That should be a 1. Okay. Yeah. Good catch. OK. So and obviously, how do you do deep Gaussian processes? J using uh, just various instantiations of multivariate normal triangular 
uh, parameterizations, you can start to stack these things. Um, so you, you can still start with, um, if you wanted to do unsupervised learning, you would still start with n by q uh, latent input. You apply a RBF. Here, of course, they're all, they're all um, fixed hyperparameters for the RBF kernels, but you can imagine that the function takes in uh, additional hyperparameters as input. Uh, and you just stack these things. So this one is n by h1 dimensional. This one has n by h2 dimensional. And then the final output is n by d dimensional. Uh, and this is an excellent sort of um, example that, that I um, read like a few years ago from David Duvernod on really understanding the power of deep GPs uh, and why they're, they're, they're t they tend to be useful if you're interested in really getting at the non-smoothness assumptions beyond uh, single layer Gaussian processes. So imagine that there is uh, some uh, identity mapping here where you start to color all the inputs in this two-dimensional space. You start to warp these things according to however many layers in a deep Gaussian process. And you really get a very complicated um, uh, color mixing given uh, just this as the input. OK. And here, I'm, I'm going to go through a, uh, a very concrete example using a Cox process, which is a Gaussian process with a uh, Poisson likelihood. OK. So this, was, this is the example that we were using um, for the basketball analysis. And in particular, we were doing this uh, to experiment with a new inference algorithm. We were coming up with various VI algorithms, one of which we, we wanted to check this alternative divergence measure. Uh, as Alan was showing, um, KLQP, uh, a various approximation uh, that tries to approximate a posterior distribution from that direction, tends to underestimate posterior uncertainty. Um, and in particular, this tends not to be very helpful for many um, Gaussian process applications. If you really were interested in posterior uncertainty, perhaps you'd like to try different um, divergence measures. So that's exactly what we're playing with. We're trying this uh, chi divergence, which, um, unlike the divergence term KL uh, posterior to the variational approximation, is actually a tractable divergence. So you could do stochastic optimization on this thing. You can get unbiased gradients. You don't have to go through local sort of excitation propagation stuff. Although that has advantages too. So. Here, imagine the data set is n by v matrix. There are n NBA players. Each NBA player it has a set of counts. There are counts. Uh, and each count is basically an attempted, the number of attempted basketball uh, shots for the nth NBA player at location v. So you basically discretize the uh, basketball court according to all of these uh, locations. Very simple. Uh, uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's a simplifying assumption, of course. And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to model some latent intensity function for each NBA player. So you, so you imagine that, given that data set, you'd like to apply some covariance function, which, uh, whose dimension is going to be n by v by v. And how does the generative process go? So for each NBA player, you have some, uh, you have some latent intensity function. And how does uh, each count arise? Each count arises from some Poisson distribution uh, which is conditionally independent, where each uh, shot and each uh, each shot for each NBA player is given by an exponential of the latent intensity function, and we apply the exponential precisely because you want uh, the rate parameter of the Poisson to be non-negative. Before going to actually, yeah, so here's the data set. It, we have this one-line API for loading in a bunch of standard data sets in ML. So all you have to do is do uh, you, you write basketball, you have some data directory, and you load in the data sets as some, as some NumPy array. The NumPy array is n by v. In this case, uh, I've simplified the model to be only 308 NBA players, um, and there are two shot locations. <coughs> so we recall the model and recall the um, actual model implementation. So it, it's, it's, uh, I actually think that this model implementation is more rigorous and uh, easier to read than the, than the math. So you have some inputs. It's n by v dimensional. Um, and here, we have to go through some craziness to, to loop across the kernel uh, evaluations. So uh, I applied the RBF per, uh, per xn, where xn is basically uh, each NBA player. Uh, and then I took that kernel, did the classic composition, put it into the latent function, and then I exponentiated the latent function. Uh, here, 
I'm doing a uh, variable inference. I'll get into the inference, how we do inference and the API a bit later. Uh, but imagine there's some variation approximation here. It's a uh, mean field, so you're, uh, you're throwing away all of the correlation between uh, the individual functions, uh, the, between the individual function evaluations. You have the latent variables that you're inferring. You pass in all the data, and you run inference. Um, and then through various preprocessing, you eventually get um, at these things as you compare the different inference algorithms, and you start to understand um, how they work for your various experiments. Any questions so far? Yes? Uh, axis aligned artifacts? Oh, these, uh, these gradient colors. Oh, uh, that, I think that's uh, just a, a plotting artifact. Okay, okay. Yeah. This is 2.7, I think. It, it does. Uh, my laptop, yeah, it's, there, there are issues. Like I, I, my laptop runs 2.7. Uh, on the servers that I do experiments on, it's on 3.4. And uh, they both work. As, as long as your scripts are compatible, like use the module six for various uh, cross compatibility, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So that was an overview of just various models. Um, so uh, let's start to get into some inference. Uh, just to set up some notation, uh, how do we actually do inference? So there is some data X strain, you have some joint distribution for your model. Imagine, you might imagine there are like variables z and beta, and you're going to calculate some posterior distribution, which is just the conditional of z and beta given x train. And it's just going to be, by Bayes' rule, the joint distribution divided by the marginal. And that's it. Sort of the magic behind Bayes' inference is that this is all you're really interested in. Anything you do, even model parameter estimation, is, uh, uh, is a formulation of this. So how does the API work? Um, inference is a class and has just two inputs. You're, you have latent variables as the first input, and what you're going to do is you're going to bind the model prior variables to the approximate factors. If you define beta and z as the latent variables in your model, you're going to bind them to some posterior approximation, q beta and qz. In your data, you're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to bind model variables to observations. So these are the realizations that are associated to the uh, observed variables. Important note here is that um, in the models that we were writing down, there was no distinction at, uh, a priori of what was observed, what was uh, latent. It's only until inference that you can really start to assign things such that I actually want to infer these uh, particular nodes conditional on these ones being, uh, being realized. So it's, it's really taking the philosophy of separating model and inference. That inference is really whatever you, you would like to do as a query and Modeling is just a bunch of different randomness that you start to compose together with various deterministic computation. Uh, and you might imagine this for practicality that there are a bunch of class methods assigned to inference. We could have some all-in-one uh, method called run. It would initialize the algorithm, do various training, check convergence, uh, throw away things for initialization, and uh, just run the algorithm. And obviously, you might do some more finer control if you're interested in larger scale experiments where you couldn't just do everything in an all-in-one uh, uh, method. So there's initialize, update, print progress, et cetera. OK. How much time do I have? OK, cool. So and obviously, you might ask, how does process programming really help Gaussian processes for inference? Uh, what are things that we could do, or we might imagine we'd like to do with uh, GPy that we just really cannot do, and we would have to start to do in, uh, custom inference or custom code? So one is about uh, using Gaussian processes with very flexible inference strategies. So if you wanted to do variable inference with inducing variables, uh, where you might want to optimize the inducing point locations, or you might just want to fix them, all of things, those things are possible if you have a very compositional and very primitive set of uh, items in which you can start to use various inference algorithms. And obviously, if you wanted to scale Gaussian processes uh, using James Hensman's approach, or if you wanted to do stochastic EP, 
uh, using Ying Zhen Li's approach, maximum likelihood, marginal likelihood, if you want to do EM, CCD as approximate integration over the uh, kernel hyperparameters. All those things are possible precisely because they're all computable. They're all things that live in the world of problems of programming. Analogously, these are not just things that mathematically you'd like to do, but you, want, might, you might want to do these things concretely. So if you wanted to represent these things on multiple machines, you wanted to do different device registrations for uh, calculating specific computation on one GPU, throwing the rest on in the CPU. If you want to do training testing with different float, uh, int uh, training and testing, all those things are also possible. Uh, I won't talk about this one, Rajesh will. You can also use Gaussian processes as posterior approximations. You can think of variable inference where you're pausing a, a posterior approximation as actually modeling. You're making assumptions with your posterior approximation. You can also use Gaussian processes as a very flexible posterior approximations. And you can also use Gaussian processes for inference within inference, which is exactly what Bayesian optimization does. Cool. How, does, how, does, uh, how do we do variable inference in Monte Carlo? So here's, here's a very simple outline. Uh, I was just showing you how to do this for variational inference. So imagine that uh, inference is really this abstract base class. There are a bunch of uh, other classes that inherit from inference. So there is, you might imagine there is some variational inference class and there is some Monte Carlo class. Both of these are, both are also abstract classes from which things like KLQP, chi variational inference, et cetera, inherit from these things. But how do these ones work? So if you wanted to uh, approximate beta and Z, assuming that these are, say, like a mixture of Gaussian, Q beta you define as some parametric family, QZ is some parametric family. You throw them into the latent variables, throw in the observations to X, into the data argument. And now obviously for Monte Carlo, uh, we would view Monte Carlo as doing empirical uh, posterior approximations. You represent the posterior distribution using a bag of samples. And so how does the empirical distribution work? You have uh, an argument which is the number of samples uh, in the empirical distribution, and then the other dimensions of the empirical distributions are uh, the, just the dimensions of it. You might also note that the, there are these things called tf. variable. These are representing the mutable states, like the parameters that you can actually change the, in the computational graph. So if you represent the model just according to various random variables, tf. variables are really things that you can actually train uh, during uh, inference. So these are the values um, that are actually the parameters. Uh, and then obviously, because uh, we represent everything on the graph, we have some preliminary work on conjugacy and exact inference. We have some uh, Gibbs sampling uh, for uh, topic models and a uh, mixture of Gaussians at the moment. OK. Uh, so here's a, here's a cool thing now that you can start to think about inference as a bunch of different primitives. So you wanted to do um, compositional inferences. So you might imagine something like the expectation maximization algorithm, if you're familiar with it, which is doing an E step, which is integrating over a bunch of latent variables. And then there's an M step, which maximizes a bunch of, uh, it does ma map or maximum a posteriori for another set of variables. How does this work here? You have some variable inference for an E step. You have some M step, which is uh, maximum a posteriori. You have Q beta, which is a point mass. That is uh, your point that you're trying to approximate as your posterior distribution, and you have some parametric family for a variational inference. And in your training procedure, you would just uh, play around with different ways of doing expectation maximization. If you only wanted to do one step of E and M, then this is how you would do it. Um, if you actually believe, and there are various reasons to believe that doing this is actually very poor, if you wanted to run E until convergence, run M until convergence, that also works. You can also think of message passing algorithms just in this setup. Um, expectation propagation what I view at is, is basically a composition of local KLPQ minimizations. So how you do expectation propagation, or, or any message passing algorithm for that matter, is basically uh, doing this procedure where you would uh, change these inference algorithms to be a bunch of local KLPQ minimizations. And then you can play around with the scheduling of the updates. <coughs> OK. Oh, and one thing to note is that we've been uh, playing around with expectation propagation precisely for some uh, work that we've been doing uh, where we view EP as a way of life uh, for all distributed computation and all of um, aggregated inference, where you're, you're combining a bunch of local inferences basically through a very large hierarchical model. And you might imagine that expectation propagation is very nice for this process because any local computation you're doing is, can be uh, stored on one device 
are stored on one machine, and you, and you can start to aggregate these things according to some master device or some master machine. OK. Um, so as a summary, um, Edward is, is really a probabilistic programming system that's de designed for experimentation. We really wanted to uh, build a system precisely on TensorFlow because we want to make a probabilistic programming practical. There's been a lot of developments that uh, were more theoretical and on methodological developments. We wanted to make something that was concrete, was motivated from uh, Gaussian process software and, um, and bugs in Stan, but uh, started to integrate uh, some of the methodological developments that probabilistic programming had. Uh, and it emphasizes not just fine-tuning of the model, where you might imagine that there is just uh, some model that compiles down to some program and you would run some automated inference. You, if you wanted to do larger scale or very complicated models, you might want to play with it around with inference algorithms themselves. And finally, in Edwards integrated TensorFlow, where we started to use these things to really scale probabilistic models. Uh, at Google, we've been trying to employ these things on some products where they're really at the scale of billions of uh, users and many, uh, many sparse features. Uh, you might imagine something like uh, Gibbs sampling for a simple graphical model uh, could work very well. Neural networks tend to be bad for sparse features. Um, and also to emphasize, there, there are various current directions that we've been working on uh, for iClear and also for certain journal submissions. So one is that uh, we've been trying to extend Edward uh, methodologically with new semantics. So one is just applying Edward across a bunch of different benchmarks for modeling inference applications, just to see how much GPUs, uh, TPUs, various uh, hardware, imp uh, hardware improvements can really uh, make probabilistic modeling just that much better. Uh, another is thinking about dynamic computational graphs. What I, was, what I was showing you all before was basically these static graphs, where you define a model, it represents some computational graph, and then you run an inference, which basically just runs the graph itself. But if you wanted to do very complicated inferences, uh, you want to have some dynamic circuitry, priors of our architectures. These things start to rely on dynamic uh, graphs. And finally, we have this one-line API that we've been working on to really extend uh, making and loading in standard data sets in ML. So you can start to play around with a bunch of different data sets without having to do all of the crazy preprocessing. And the, the library tends to be pretty minimal in the amount of preprocessing, just so you can have standards for working with different data sets. And finally, we've been also been applying Edward for various uh, research applications. So with uh, Dave Bly, Barbara Engelhardt, and John Soray, we've been, we've been using causal models uh, precisely in the application I was showing where you try to understand genetic factors and how they influence uh, diseases. Uh, at OpenAI, I've been working on some of these applications where you've been trying to do alignment with language. You wanted to use generative models to improve our language understanding through uh, various sorts of tasks where you might imagine there are two unpaired data sets and you want to learn some sort of transfer between the data sets, even if you don't have any supervision or paired examples. And if you really were interested in artificial general intelligence, like strong AI, you might imagine doing this through a principle known as Kolmogorov complexity. You would learn probabilistic programs or programs that represent the data and whose um, program re is really embodying Occam's razor, that the shortest program, the program with the shortest length, tends to represent the data best. Um, and this is precisely all through what I view as, as probabilistic modeling. These are all things whose primitives are both uh, stochasticity with respect to random variables and various computations that can include neural nets as an example. Uh, and finally, to highlight, um, there, are, there are two NIPS workshops uh, that I'd like to highlight, aside from uh, the Bayesopt one. There's a Proxima Bayesian inference that we're holding uh, this year again, and there's also Bayesian Deep Learning, uh, which has some in interesting things with probabilistic programming. And we have two NIPS papers uh, this year in our group. Uh, Rajesh will be talking about the implicit models work, and I was just uh, a bit highlighting uh, our work on uh, alternative divergence measures, specifically the chi divergence, which has a lot of cool uh, Gaussian process applications. Uh, thanks. How many questions?
Yeah. Um, so I have this table um, that I usually show in, the, in, in this talk. Um, I didn't show it here. Um, but the, the price you pay actually isn't anything. Um, and the reason for this is because the underlying computational graph uh, you're writing for, for uh, either the generic one or like a model-specific one, where you're, you're hand-coding the algorithm in the model, um, it's exactly the same thing. Um, so we have an experiment where we ran a hands-written HMC uh, on basic logistic regression, and we compared it to our generic implementation of HMC. Um, and they ran at the exact same runtime. Uh, you, you, you play around with various uh, GPUs, play around with the data set sizes. The graphs are exactly the same, so computation runtime would be exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. You just make a statement at the very end that I, I'm really curious about. You talked about the simplest program. Yeah. You used the phrase shortest. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you mean shortest or do you mean simplest? Yeah. Yeah, um, so Occam's Razor is, is an interesting principle which basically says that the simplest model uh, generalizes best, basically. That, um, and, and that's really what happens when you try to do something like maximum likelihood and maximum marginal likelihood. When you're trying to maximize the probability of observing a data set according to log p of x, uh, you're, you're going ac across this uh, phenomenon. When I, when I say something like the shortest program according to the length of the program, uh, that's what Kolmogorov envisions as what is simplest. If you're thinking about something like an actual model with various parameters, what would be the simplest model is basically uh, according to the probability of observing the model and the amount of bits to represent all of the parameters and the architecture in that model. If you could represent a model according to fewer layers that still describes the data best, that would be simplest. Okay, that's, that's nice Thank you. Yeah, sure. Cool. I'm happy to go through some of this uh, as uh, you're interested in, in person. <laughs>